Well, first of all, I'd like to welcome you all and thank you for coming out in this intrepid weather. It's not a lot of fun to um, brave the elements, but when you have a group like this that you're going to listen to, I think it makes it that much more worthwhile. This is the second year for the Sussman Conversation on the Constitution and the Courts, this year focusing on individual constitutional rights. The Aspen Institute, as you know, is an amazing place led by a phenomenal man, Walter Isaacson, for whom we are so grateful. Um, he has opened our eyes and made this institution even bigger and more wonderful than it was when it started. And Justice and Society has been one of the core programs here for over 35 years. Um, it has had the backing of some of the best and the brightest minds in this country, starting with Harry Blackman and Alice Henkin, who sort of nurtured it in the beginning and set the tone for a place and a program that could really um, confront the difficult questions that the law engaged in as it related to society in a whole. And I'd like to say that led by Merrill Chertoff, Justice and Society is having a new reinvigoration. And this year they've had a wonderful year culminating with the publication of this book, Principled Pluralism, which shows how we live out the First Amendment values of free exercise in our life. Now, some of you were at the Ideas Festival, and I'm sure you heard Justice Breyer being interviewed by Noah Feldman, and you know that he's fluent in French. I don't think he's going to speak French this evening or lapse into it, but uh, I do think that there's going to be a wide-ranging conversation about the interconnected world, about our courts and the courts of other nations. Um, also, on a personal note, it's a pleasure to have Justice Breyer because my husband Steve's brother, Tommy, uh, worked with Justice Breyer for a long time with Senator Kennedy when he was alive on the Judiciary Committee. So I was sorry that Tommy couldn't come, but we're really thrilled to have Justice Breyer and Joanna and their son Michael with us. Um, you may not know the Honorable Margaret Marshall. She's also an amazing, amazing woman who is South African by birth, came to the United States, thought she was going to major in art history and sort of made this hard left turn and decided that she'd become a lawyer. Um, she fought against apartheid in South Africa. Um, she went to Yale. She went to um, Harvard, well, Yale Law School. But it was her decision in Goodridge versus the Department of Health that declared that the Massachusetts Constitution does not permit the state to deny citizens the right to same-sex marriage. Her decision in that case was groundbreaking, and I would venture to say that it opened the door for probably the decision that the Supreme Court made about gay marriage uh, just a few weeks ago. <clears throat> Justice Brandeis said that states are the laboratories of democracy, and the work of state supreme courts on interpreting their own constitutions often has paved the work by the United States Supreme Court. Um, I really think we're going to have an amazing talk led by Elliot Gerson, who, as you know, is one of the best moderators around, and I'm going to turn it over to them. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Merrill. Thank you, Walter, and thank you both for being here. Well, I'd like, first of all, to thank all of you for being here. A special thanks to Ellen and Stephen for your generosity. This is, in a summer full of wonderful things, in a short period of time, this has already become really a signature event, and we thank you. And Meryl Chertoff has really expanded one of our most important and longstanding programs and brought it in wonderful new directions. Today, we have two, two luminaries of American law here. And the fact that we have uh, Justice Marshall here, I think is an important reminder of something that many of us forget, even those of us who are lawyers. And that is that we have something unique in this country in our constitutional system. We have state constitutional courts and the work that the judges on the highest courts of the states play in interpreting state constitutions. And in many cases, the state constitutional justices have actually taken individual rights steps further than even our federal Supreme Court has. It's, it's a unique aspect. Some, some people call it a dual federalism. And we'll talk a little bit about the interplay about state and, and federal constitutions. But before we begin our conversation, I'd like to mention one other thing, because Justice Marshall is here. And that's to, to, to point out that Justice Marshall really was part of a team of two 
in terms of uh, 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 protecting uh, the individual rights in the United States. And when she retired from the uh, Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts in 2010, uh, she retired in part to be able to spend uh, more time uh, with her husband. Uh, and as she put it, I think, at the time, to be able to share their last seasons together. And, and we, um, uh, Justice Marshall, want to uh, uh, share our own condolences in, 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 in uh, the loss of your husband a few months ago, who was also an enormous loss for the country. Uh, Anthony Lewis, Tony Lewis, was a giant, a champion of uh, individual rights, a champion of the Bill of Rights. Uh, he not only won two Pulitzers for his uh, reporting and columns in the New York Times, he wrote the magisterial Gideon's, Gideon's Trumpet. And, uh, and, and, and really, uh, I think significantly, uh, did probably more than any other reporter in the United States to explain the role of the courts, and especially the Supreme Court, in a very sophisticated way. And I think it's, it's fair also to say that that kind of explanation of the role of the court continued now par excellence by Justice Breyer because it's not part of the job description of a Supreme Court justice to go out as often in the public and explain, explain the role of the court, explain opinions. And Justice Breyer is one of the few. Uh, 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 retired Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, one of our trustees, is another, who go to great lengths uh, to provide this important civic function. So we appreciate that, and we appreciate enormously the contributions of Tony Lewis. Uh, as you all heard in Ellen's introduction, um, and I'll start with you, Justice Marshall. Uh, the Goodridge case, you wrote over 300 opinions, many of them enormously important, but that perhaps uh, most notable, especially in the light of the last Supreme Court term. And I, I'd, I'd like to go back to 2003 and, and when you wrote that opinion uh, for, the, for the court, finding a right in the Massachusetts Constitution uh, for, for gay marriage, uh, you were criticized pretty widely and, and strongly from all quarters, uh, from the Massachusetts legislature, from the governor's office. I think the governor was one Mitt Romney at the time. He was. And all the way up <laughs> to the Supreme Court. Uh, and I, 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 I wonder if you were prepared for that and, and, and whether you thought at all about what the reaction would be or whether you just looked at the Massachusetts Supreme Court as a constitution and felt that you had no choice but to come to the conclusion that you did. I probably wasn't as prepared as I might have been, uh, not so much for the Massachusetts reaction because there had been decisions from my court where, believe me, I had come in for a lot of criticism and... Um, as a, as a strong believer in the First Amendment, I think judges you know, who are members of our government can be criticized along with everybody else. And as you know, we are different in that regard from most other countries. What I had not anticipated, and I really hadn't at all, was the reaction from around the country and around the world. And although I was criticized, uh, the opinion was also praised. Um, and I just hadn't anticipated that. Now, you might say that that was naivete. I don't think it was. I think unlike serving on the United States Supreme Court, state court judges, I mean, we know our opinions are followed in other fora, but we don't think we're going to make national and international news on the scale <coughs> that the, of the response to Goodrich. And I have to say, uh, as, as you and Ellen mentioned, I grew up in South Africa and for a very tiny village, and it is a little odd when the President of the United States points his finger at you and says, you are a judicial activist. That's a kind of funny feeling. Now, he may call that to, to Justice Breyer all the time, <laughs> and presidents may do that, <laughs> but not if you're sitting on the Massachusetts court. So uh, I, I think the reaction did take me by surprise. Do you think your experience growing up in apartheid South Africa strengthened you in any way for the kinds of courageous positions you took on the court? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, when you, come, when, you, when you become a judge, you bring to that position your entire life history. And when you're sitting on a court, you try very hard to put aside your own personal views. Um, and so, and gay marriage really was not part of my 
thinking in South Africa. In fact, gay marriage hadn't been part of my thinking in the United States, and so I didn't make a you know, one-to-one -one connection. My life had been involved with uh, issues of race discrimination, um, deeply involved in issues of gender discrimination, to some extent involved with dis issues of uh, disability law. Uh, but I can recall, and I don't say this proudly, but just to give you some sense of how much things have changed. When I was the general counsel at Harvard University, which I was in the early 1990s, I was asked to come and speak to a meeting of um, same sex, uh, same uh, of, of gay and lesbian alumni of Harvard University, and somebody said the conference was going to be held on the anniversary of the Stonewall Rebellion, and I had never heard of the Stonewall Rebellion. That was 1992 or three or four. I mean, that is pretty astounding for somebody who had been very involved in equality. And uh, I mean, I say that with, uh, you know, just. To, as an historical fact, and not because I'm proud about it, but so I think gay marriage um, had, just wasn't on my agenda. Uh, Justice Breyer, uh, I don't know if there's ever been a time where public opinion has changed as broadly and as rapidly, perhaps, uh, as in the case of gay marriage. And, and uh, I, I wonder if you could comment a little bit about the role of public opinion uh, at the Supreme Court. Uh, you were, of course, in the five votes uh, overruling uh, or declaring that, that uh, DOMA was unconstitutional. It's hard, I think, for some of us to believe that even as, as, as little ago as one or two years, the Supreme Court might have come to that same conclusion. I'm sure you will say it probably would have, but tell, tell us about no, that. No, the truth of the matter is I don't know. Uh -huh. And that's the truth. Uh, and and uh, Margie just put this very well, which is, I'll put the same point three different ways. One, I don't know. Two, she said exactly what I think. No, of course what you're trying to do is to decide the matter on the law as it is what now? Now. I look at the briefs, I look at the law, I'm trying to get it right. No. My entire life is there on these open cases. My background, of course, matters. No, it doesn't matter. Oh, yes. Well, okay, <laughs> perfect, perfect. And you find a judge who says he doesn't think that, they do. Of course they do. And, and, and the third way, and why this is such an interesting case in this area, uh, to me, is you, think, you have to think of Loving versus Virginia. Loving versus Virginia was the miscegenation case, interracial marriage. And it came up to the Supreme Court well before Loving versus Virginia came up, the question of whether a law forbidding inter uh, interracial marriage was uh, unconstitutional, which it was. The court had decided Brown. Frankfurter said, don't take this case. And they didn't. They didn't take it for a, quite a while. And eventually, when things had settled down some, and it was clear that the segregation was going to end, we thought, then they took the case, loving for Virginia, and said it's unconstitutional. You see, there's discretion in what cases we take. Was Frankfurter right? That's something that is much debated, much debated. Personally, I've read about Eisenhower and Little Rock and how important I think that was, taking those 1,000 paratroopers from Fort Bragg and sending them to Little Rock and escorting the, black, the Little Rock Nine into the high schools. And, and look what it took. The Freedom Riders, Martin Luther King, endlessly. We've lived through that. Of course we know that. And, and you can't read that without thinking maybe Frankfurter was right. Because the most important thing was to get this principle of desegregation accepted. Now, is all that there with this gay marriage? No, it's not. It's not there. When people meet people who are gay and they say, I'm gay, they're friends. Okay? I think you had a hand in that. I think you had a hand in that. But it isn't the same thing. All right? So, so but nonetheless, you're asking me, well, suppose we'd really had a problem about whether this would be accepted in a large number of states and people go up in arms and you think of all these things. Would the court have decided to take the case? Well, I don't know, do I? <laughs> I know I did live through what we did live through. And of course we're going to take it. And of course all the lower courts who had decided this, and there were quite a few, uh, have uh, said it was unconstitutional. 
And if you sat there as I did and read the briefs, I think, but how can I prove it? I can't. But I think most people would come to the conclusion when you see the harm the law was causing and you look on the other side, and I'm putting it not in constitutional terms, but it's direct, you can, I can feed this directly into the constitutional problem of equal protection and so forth. I won't get too complicated. But say, what's your justification for this? A little skimpy. A little skimpy, <laughs> said the majority. Uh, a little skimpy on the reasons for passing these 1,000 statutes, uh, you know, and amending in, in, in this, in this uh, way. All right. So I read through those briefs and say, of course, it would have come out the same way if they'd taken it sooner. And then I think, you see? And so there I'm back to Margie. <laughs> no, of course not. Well. <laughs> Let, let me I'm ask, glad you took it. <laughs> we all are. Let, let me ask a, a, a different kind of question. What you've often written about, and I think perhaps your next book is going to be about the Supreme Court in a global context and the topic of whether or not foreign law, foreign, foreign judgment should inform American courts. In reverse, what, what kind of effect do you think that opinion might have in other countries? Well, again, I don't really know. There, I really don't know. How do I know better than the people who, you know, live in those countries and or go there more often than I do? I mean, it might or it might not. I, I can't answer that question because I don't know the answer better than anyone else in the room. What do you think? Oh, I think it. I think one can at least posit an answer in this sense. You know, I think we in the United States forget that our constitutional form of democracy, with the Charter of Rights enforced by an independent court, was unusual. Was not followed in most of the world, really, from, 19, from 1780 until 1948 in Germany. Parliamentary systems are completely different, and people often look to the United States. And I think what's happened in the, around the world, increasingly in the post-Second World War era, more and more countries have turned to what I call the American system, a written charter of rights. Why? Because we didn't like the way Parliament was working in Germany, for one, and quite a few other places. And when you begin to have models that are similar to the United States, you begin to look at United States courts. Um, but you also look at other courts. So if you're in South Africa or Canada to choose two English-speaking uh, constitutional courts, so they look at our opinions, but they also look at Canadian opinions, and they also look at uh, opinions from other constitutional courts. It's not really helpful when you're a parliamentary system to look at the United States because it was just a different system. And I think the United States continues to have quite a considerable degree of influence, but it's not the only influence. It's not the only influence because they're wonderful judgments that come from other courts. From my point of view, when I was sitting on the Supreme Judicial Court, I always enjoyed looking at what other courts who are now functioning and that our system were doing. It wasn't helpful before 1987 in Canada to look at what the parliamentary system was doing. It was very helpful to me to look at judgments. Did I follow them? Were they precedential? Of course not. But was it helpful? Yes, it was helpful. And I think it always will be. No, it's, 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 what, you're, anyone in this room is as capable of answering one question as I am, which is uh, uh, the headline is Supreme Court strikes down the anti-gay marriage law, federal law is unconstitutional. And then people react to that all over the world. But if you're asking a question of how will the lawyers react, the lawyers will read our decision. Now our decision is not talking about what her decision talked about. Her, her decision is uh, interpreting the Massachusetts Constitution and whether they have to have uh, treat the, the gays the same in respect sure. to marriage as uh, heterosexuals, homosexuals, doesn't matter, okay? Our question was a different question. Our question was, is a federal law in this era, area of marriage, which really goes through a thousand statutes and deprives people who are lawfully married, who are gay, of federal benefits, such as $300,000 in tax deductions, is that consistent with the Constitution of the United States? And they'll read the opinion, and they'll see there's a great deal of emphasis in that opinion on the fact that it is primarily, not completely, but primarily up to states to define what marriage is. Family law is a matter of state law almost entirely. 
And so the federal government was intruding here in an area that's primarily state. Now, this is how the lawyers are going to look at it. And you say, well, will it make a difference? I say, I'm not sure. You see what? And, and by the way, since we're, I can bring that up, since I pointed out, which I you know, normally point out to the 10th graders, <laughs> what her court does, and it's important that they know this, in the 10th grade, Law in the United States is primarily almost 90%, 95%, a matter of state law. Of course marriage law is 99% state. And you go through tort law or criminal law or business law, and you'll see primarily state, primarily state, environmental, education, you name it. And so what she's doing is sitting, which is what I tell the students, and it's why, if you want to make a difference in your community, don't read the headlines in the New York Times and the Post, which are about the Supreme Court of the United States. <laughs> go find out what's actually happening in the law and go back to your communities and work there. And that's, uh, that's uh, why she can do that, you see, with the... Uh, I, I just want to give this audience just a taste of that, because I know Justice Bly has had so many cases. So the latest figures that I have are 2010, and I say this with the greatest respect to the federal courts. If you took every court, every case that was filed in every federal court in the United States, trial court, intermediate appellate court, United States Supreme Court, other than bankruptcy, in 2010 there were about 1.2 million cases filed. In state courts, trial courts, intermediate, supreme judicial court types of uh, courts, excluding traffic offenses, guess, 48 million cases. So he gets to pick. <laughs> yeah, she's including traffic tickets. No, 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 no. I said not traffic not, tickets. Not 48 million cases. I mean, it, you know, so state courts. And of course, in a funny kind of way, I mean, I, I'm going to steal a, a phrase of Justice Bly's used in a different context, which in states is where things bubble up. They bubble up. There's so much happening out. And I know, of course, we're a great nation and we are one nation. But I want to tell you, I want to tell you, Massachusetts and North Dakota, hmm, not a lot in common. <laughs> great Chief Justice. I love the Chief Justice. It's just different. And so, you know, Massachusetts, uh, I don't want to go back to the gay marriage case all the time, but Massachusetts, you know, we had adoptions. We had the state placing foster children in same gender couples. We had um, Governor Weld had, you know, wanted to have a huge teaching program in middle schools about how not to discriminate. I mean, Massachusetts was just different. And so gay marriage, in a sense, sat comfortably in Massachusetts, and I don't know how to have fitted fat in North Dakota. Let's go back to a discussion of another aspect of individual liberty and individual freedom. There's been a lot of discussion the last few weeks around the country of uh, the, the, the relationship between individual freedom and national security. You've actually written a great deal about this. You don't face the same kind of issues that Justice Breyer faces in, in the U.S. Supreme Court. But you have written fair, quite forcefully that judges must insist on government accountability as vigorously in wartime, or whether it's declared war or war and terror, as they do any other time. And you, you wrote that a democracy must sometimes fight with one hand behind its back. Even so, democracy has the upper hand. I, I wonder what you see as the implications as, as no longer a sitting judge and not facing these kinds of questions about these issues in the context of things like national surveillance or detention at Guantanamo Bay. On my court, we didn't have as many um, you know, decisions of, of the touched on issues of Guantanamo Bay, but I would say this. You know, I grew up in, a in South Africa during the apartheid years, and almost everything that I detested was done in the name of national security. I mean, it had a racial overtone to it, but the reason why people were banned, the reason why people were put into prison, the reason why people disappeared in the middle of the night was because the South African government articulated that that was necessary to maintain national security. And so I think I bring, I bring to my view of the world a profound sense that you have to really test that and test it all of the time. 
And of course, um, I think what has made this country such a great country, um, a really great country, is transparency in our government, which is why, the way, why I think people can criticize judges, for example. It's not really comfortable, but I think they have a right to do it. They should know how we do go about our business. How does the Supreme Court select its cases? Transparency is important. And knowing what our government is doing is terribly important. And so I think they are hard questions. Obviously, the United States um, in 9-11 um, uh, suffered the kind of uh, attack uh, on our security that was almost unprecedented, certainly for us. And so that has changed a view. But I tend to think uh, that one should always be skeptical when the claim is national security and, and, and push for transparency. Um, and be careful, be careful. Justice Breyer, how, how, how should a judge respond when the executive branch comes to you and talks about national security and, and issues that judges are not trained in, and when the country is at war, when lives are at stake, is it a different posture that you take when, when they come to you with those well, consequences? There, there is a, look, the, the President and the Congress are in charge of the security of the United States. The judges are not. And that's constitutional, you can trace it. The judges, however, are responsible for protecting individual rights. I mean, they're first and foremost, that's what they do with unpopular people. You try to infringe some kind of protected right of a person uh, as an unpopular person, uh, I'm sorry. That unpopular person's entitled to the same right as the most popular. So these two specialties collide in that situation. And where Margie I completely agree with is it used to be thought, and I said this, uh, I found out, some, somebody told me, uh, uh, Cicero said, so he says, Cicero said this. He said, and I can't remember it in Latin, so I'll get it all wrong. It was like arma decet decant legis sealant or something, which I said means when, the, I like the, my translation. Uh, I said, when the cannons roar, the laws fall silent. And I said that once to an audience, and they said, you idiot, the Romans didn't have cannons. <laughs> but, or, but, but, you, or, but, but, but we've, we've changed from that, okay? And her attitude is right. The law applies. Now, that's the beginning of the problem, sure. not the end. Because if you look at many of the protections of human rights, for example, privacy, reasonable searches and seizures, it says no unreasonable searches and seizures. Okay, what is unreasonable? And if somebody's throwing a bomb or something, it might be quite different than if they're not. And that's the argument. And you will discover it goes on. We have two, we have one tremendous help in this. And it isn't necessarily the government. The government helps like any other group of, of, of lawyers. One, I'll say, good thing about the lawyers. They help particularly. Why? Because the defense lawyer in this case, if it's a prosecution, or somebody could be on the plaintiff's side, but the side that's against the government, is undoubtedly going to ask two questions. And these two questions are very helpful. And they focus the point she's making. When you see an ordinary protection being diluted because of wartime, Guantanamo, you see, or World War II and the Germans in prison camps and so forth, or the ones who landed in the submarines? The first question, why? This is a question the Israelis face all the time. And the judges ask it. And the lawyers ask it. Why? And the government better come up with a good answer. And if the government says, I'm sorry, it's a secret, hey, well, there are ways around that. Uh, you can have them show it to the judges privately. We can't even let the other lawyer in. Okay, prove it to us. <laughs> and if you can't, okay, still better to have the judge looking at it. There are ways. So now we look at it. And the second question is, why not? If they show why, then the lawyer says, hey, why not do it this way? Which is you get your obstacle. You can build the wall across Jerusalem, says Aron Barak, the, the, the chief justice. Build the wall, okay. But build it so you don't shut out the Arabs on these farms over here from getting their water supply. Why not do it that way? And those two questions, why, why not, are very powerful questions. So I would say, remember what the justice has just said. There is a hierarchy. And his two questions are dependent on what? 
access to a lawyer. Access to a lawyer. And I would say that the thing I feared most in South Africa is that I would be arrested and I would not have access to a lawyer. You have to have a lawyer. So you learn to have a kind of sensitivity around things that are really going wrong. And the second thing is access for the lawyer to a judge. There is something terribly important about the adversary process, and I think... Yeah, it's ad and remember that, too. It's sure. adversary. There are often very good arguments on the security side. Very good. It isn't true but that they're, one you know, they're making all this stuff up. Once, I mean, uh, they, they come in and they present things one on the government sided, side that, that often shows... One-sided courts are not courts. No. One-sided courts are not courts. Adversary process with a lawyer Correct. representing. Good luck. <laughs> Justice Breyer, you, you mentioned search and seizure, and you also had said that uh, you had you had some trouble with the dog case this term. Oh, that was a tough case. And, and, <laughs> Particularly if you like dogs. <laughs> Why was it tough? Oh, it was tough. It was a question of unreasonable search and seizure. I'll put I'll put the question to you. We divided five four. I think I was. Uh, but but here you, you uh, a a policeman without a warrant, who's standing in the street, can look into your house. If you leave the window open, that's your problem. So he, can, he can do that. And he can go up to the front door, too, like any other person, unless you put up a sign saying you don't want him. But few people think of putting up that sign. <laughs> so, so by and large, you can go up to the front door if you're a policeman, and like anybody else. Uh, uh, and that's not unreasonable, because you have all kinds of people going up to the front door all the time. Now. Suppose the policeman comes up to the front door with a dog. Well, I say everyone likes dogs. What's wrong with that? Dogs come up all the time. Yeah, that's the problem. This dog is trained to sniff marijuana inside the house. <laughs> all right. Now, does he have to have a warrant or not? Well, I mean, people come up with dogs all the time. Hey, but not marijuana sniffing dogs. Well, how finely do you want to cut this? I mean, what, what, is this unreasonable or is it not unreasonable? And what are you going to do in an apartment house, by the way, when the person who called you in was the next door neighbor? And what, what are you going to do in, you, you, you see, you go through all kinds of, 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 of possibilities. Uh, and it's a, I found it a very, very difficult case. I ended up, I, I'll tell you, I ended up deciding for the dog. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Justice Marshall, you've often um, written about someone who uh, appeared in the first case, I think, in the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, uh, a man named Quark Walter. Walker. Walker. Tell, what, tell us why he is so significant. The, the Massachusetts Constitution is 1780, first constitution, oldest written constitution in the world still being enforced. And unlike the federal constitution, it starts with the Charter of Rights. All men are born free and equal. It's changed. It now says all people. But it did say all men. <laughs> all men are born free and equal and have certain natural and inalienable rights, among which may be counted, blah, blah, blah. Massachusetts in 1780 had slavery. We forget. You know, it's not always the South that's wrong, right? Sometimes it's the North as well. And um, the five justices on the Supreme Judicial Court had all been appointed by the governor, i.e. by the king. They weren't revolutionaries. And this case comes before the court with a brilliant lawyer. You need a good lawyer. Levi Lincoln went on to become the United States Attorney General, saying, excuse me here, Justice, as it says, all men are created equal. And the case involved the, the uh, desertion of a slave and his, quote, owner bringing him back and beating him up, and it was a complicated case. And the Supreme Judicial Court in 1783 said that slavery was unconstitutional. Mm. And Massachusetts has not had slavery since 1783. Now, when I was in South Africa, there were only two cases that I knew about in the United States. I didn't even know the courts were different. They both said Supreme Courts, I thought, it was the same case same court. One was the Quark Walker case. Wonderful case. Brilliant, wonderful case. And the second, of course, is Brown against Board of Education. And so when Governor Weld nominated me to this court, it just felt like such an incredible privilege and honor. But I think, again, it's wonderful to teach about the case because judges, they were the same five justices who were there beforehand. I mean, they weren't revolutionaries, and yet when you come before a judge, I, my experience has been 
all judges try very hard, very hard to, to look at the language, to see what it means, and try their very best. And here were, we know that the Chief Justice was a slave owner. I mean, so th this was pretty close. This was pretty close. It verifies we like judges, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and my husband loved sleeping with the judge. I have to. <laughs> uh, we'll move on to something else now. Um, uh, uh, Justice, Justice Marshall. Um, I couldn't resist. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, Nelson Mandela has been on everyone's mind around the globe. And you obviously knew him and knew him well. Is there a, a, a episode or an anecdote that you could share with us that that that, that evoke him in your mind? I want to mention two, and I'll make them brief. The first, after South Africa had been through the constitutional process, um, and. Uh, president Mandela, Nelson Mandela was then president, uh, there was a case brought against the African National Congress, his party, overwhelming majority party, to the constant new constitutional, brand new constitutional court in South Africa. And the courts ruled against the African National Congress and President Mandela. And it was a stunning political defeat for Mandela. Stunning. And he went out onto the steps of parliament the next day and he said in that wonderful voice of his, today is a victory for all South Africans because it shows that even if you are a powerful political party, the rule of law will prevail. And I just, you know, we know that he's a man of great dignity and generosity, but for me to be a political leader in a very difficult constitutional situation, um, that was one. A fabulous moment. And then another slightly more personal one, a, a, a friend who was on Robben Island with Mandela told me this anecdote. He said he and President, he and Nelson Mandela, he wasn't president, shared the same birthday. And they, as prisoners on Robben Island, they were allowed one present at Christmas time. And many of the prisoners liked black magic chocolates. They were like Godiva chocolates, mixed chocolates. And um, their birthday was in June, their shared birthday. And every year, President Mandela would ask his wife for a box of chocolates and then keep them in his cell until June and then go to this colleague and give it to him as a birthday present. And every year, the next year, the colleague asked his wife for a box of chocolates. <laughs> and then somehow, somewhere around about February, he'd think, well, if I just took one and <laughs> squished it around, <laughs> and by June, Mandela would give him the box of chocolates, and he had no box of chocolates to give him back again. <laughs> and I just think, if you want to talk about discipline and generosity, I love that anecdote about him. <laughs> Can I add a footnote to this? Please. Because what she doesn't know, which is true, on the 10th anniversary of the South African Constitutional Court, which was a few years ago, I had the chance to go there. Now, Mr. Mbeki was the president, and I talked to quite a few of the judges. They're nervous about it. They're nervous because they're making a lot of decisions he doesn't like, and they don't know what he's going to do. Is he going to follow them? So they had a banquet that night, and into the banquet walks Mr. Mandela with Mr. Mbeki sitting there. And, you know, if you, any of you, I'm sure you have, been in a room where he comes in, he starts to say, the room lights up. It just lights up. And he told that story. He told your first story. Oh, wonderful. He told oh. the story with Mr. Mbeki sitting there, and you could just hear an audible sigh of relief from the judges and the lawyers after he told it. And I will say that President Mbeki obeyed every order, sometimes dragging the feet a little, that's nothing new, and President Zuma has obeyed every order. Not too many new democracies, think of them. So when people say to me, what is happening in South Africa, I know it's a lawyer, a judge's point of view, but it makes a difference. And I think Mandela made a huge difference in that regard.
I love that anecdote. I'm going to add that to mine. <laughs> I'm going to open things up to the audience in just a minute. Uh, the, 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 this term ends with lots of what the media call blockbusters. One case that the media seemed to dismiss as, as insignificant because the court just threw it back was the affirmative action case. And I don't think that's how you view it, as insignificant. What, explain to us what the court did in that judgment. Well, of course, it's, 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 and it would require more time, and it's more difficult than you think, that there are two views of the Constitution in that area. One view is the 14th Amendment, which says equal protection of the laws means that the Constitution is colorblind. That means you cannot discriminate in favor or against on the basis of race. And uh, there are a lot of good arguments for that. The other view, which is closer to my own way of thinking, is that the 14th Amendment was put there to bring people inclusively into our society who had previously not been there. And they had been slaves. And they were free. And so there is a big difference between a law that mentions color or race, where it's trying to be inclusive and bring people into the society on the basis of equality, than a law that is exclusive, which was called segregation. Now, those two views in the law are at war. And of course, different judges hold different views in different degrees. And our court is closely divided on that kind of question. Well, several years ago, we decided, first, uh, Justice Powell, in a case called Backey, which was in the University of California, wrote an opinion that was simply a concurring opinion, but people have taken as the law of the United States since then, where he said, yes, if I parody it, I mean, uh, so don't take me as literal. Uh, which never take me as too literal, but, but, but the, 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 uh, uh, you can have affirmative action. It's positive, it's inclusive, but be careful. Don't do it too much or go too far. Be very careful. No quotas, etc. but yes, you can, individually, etc. Now, his view was picked up in a case called Gruder, where I was in the majority, Sandra O'Connor wrote the opinion. Uh, Ruth Ginsburg was dissented. She thought it should go further. But the court held in Grutter five or six years ago that yes, you can in university admissions take Justice Powell's view. You can, and this was five of the court, it was the majority, you can use affirmative action. But be careful, don't go too far. And in the opinion, there's a thing, we hope this will not be necessary, and it may not be necessary in 25 years, et cetera. So it looks as if there's some sort, well, I'll leave out the lawyers to interpret that, what that means. But there's a, it's, a, it's saying be very careful. Now, the case comes up again, the same issue out of Texas. And what will the court do? What will, there was a lot of speculation about what they would do. And uh, Gruder, I did look up, and it hasn't led to a lot of litigation. People have lived with that reasonably well. Well, would there be a change? Would they say no affirmative action? What would the court do? Well, I can tell you what the court did do. What the court did do is seven members of the court said Grutter is the law. So what do I say? <laughs> I say, that's right, that was my view. Grutter is the law. And seven members of the court said that, and, and Justice Ginsburg, taking the same position she took before. Dissented alone. Yeah, and she said, no, they should go further and so forth. And uh, there we are. And uh, so uh, that's why I think it's an important case, and sometimes an important case is simply reaffirming another case, which reaffirmed another case. And, and you said the other night you don't like being in the minority. What a surprise. You don't like dissenting as much as you do. And, and I wonder if there are times, and maybe this was a case like this, you chose not to join Justice Ginsburg's decision. Are there times where you actually think it might be better, even though you're, you're, you feel passionately about an issue, to join the majority, to be able to influence the decision and how it's written, as opposed to sticking on a firm principle? Well, you know, nobody likes to make an unprincipled decision. And the way I would think about it is the following, and this is a very big and rather deep question for any judge on any court. The Constitution is not the Constitution according to Justice O'Connor, according to me, according to Justice Chief Justice Rehnquist, or according to any other individual judge. And an interpretation is not an interpretation by an individual judge. We wear black robes to symbolize, in my view, I've always heard this, the anonymity of the law. It's a court. 
It's what the court says that matters. And the court is made up of individuals who are serious and who are hardworking and who have somewhat different views of what the law is. And every member of a court knows that about his colleagues. And, and therefore, you try your best to produce an opinion that will reflect the views of the court. Now, you can't go too far. You can't sign up to something that you think is deeply wrong. And then, in many, many cases, a, 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 a judge is put in the, in the position of, well, it's, can I agree to this? Can I agree? Other people think it's right. What changes have to be made? And it is, in a sense, negotiation, but it's not the like negotiation where Tommy Sussman and I were working for Senator Kennedy. I promise you it is not like the Senate of the United States. It is not a political body. It doesn't work that way. But still, you have to face the question in a very special kind of environment, which is not a political environment, of how do you get that majority opinion and what is it going to say? And sometimes, and not necessarily with me, with other judges, and they'll do it, they might spend two months writing one of the greatest dissents ever written, and they'll swallow it in order to get their way enough to get them to join. That is a common experience. And if you're not prepared to do that, you shouldn't, I, well, you see. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's, let's please, Stuart, or let's, we'll have microphones for you if you could wait for the microphone. Thank you. Mr. Justice, uh, our political system has many problems, but one issue that many people agree that money is killed or hurting our political system. How did the Supreme Court justify that corporations and PACs could contribute as individuals can? Uh, you want to know how they justify it? I'll tell you, but I, won't, I, I don't want to persuade you, because I was in dissent in that case. <laughs> but I'll tell you how. The Constitution says, Congress shall pass no law abridging the freedom of speech. Now, money is not speech. But you try running a political campaign without money. I mean, if you were to say no money in a political campaign, you would, in fact, have the incumbent forever law. All right? And so the First Amendment does have something to say about this. Now, no other than Learned Hand, probably the greatest judge this nation has ever set, had, said, don't get into the business as a judge of trying to say this person should speak less so that that person can speak more. Because once you start down that road, you won't know, there's no stopping place, and yet that is what campaign laws do. They say this person speaks less with his money paid to support a point of view that he believes in, you see? So that those others who have less money will be able to have their voice heard more, okay? So, now, do you see what they're saying? That's not such a bad argument. So you say, why do I take the other side? To take the other side, I have to say, no, Learned Hand didn't know what the world was going to be like today. And we have to be able to draw the line somewhere. Not us, but we have to be able to let Congress draw the line somewhere. So that by spending $20 million, whether it's somebody from Nevada or George Soros or whoever, he cannot shut the door on the people who have only $5 to give. But that requires bringing judgment into the case to decide whether the legislature is actually trying to keep the playing field balanced more evenly or whether the legislature is trying to write the Incumbent Protection Act. So to be consistent with my point of view and, and the view I've, I had to vote in the majority in a case out of Vermont where they had passed a law saying nobody can contribute more than $100 to the gubernatorial election. I thought that went too far. You can't even have a coffee and donuts for the man trying to challenge the incumbent. But now you see the judge, they see the kinds of decisions that, you, that I'm asking judges to make in order to further the point of view that you implicitly, or perhaps explicitly, stated in your question. Not so easy a question, is it? Justice Marshall, let me ask you about uh, money in state courts and its effect. 
the city's Citizens United effect at the next level. You were an appointed judge, but in many states, judges are elected. How pernicious, if at all, is the effect of money in state courts? I have to go back one step, and it's still the First Amendment, and it's like Justice Breyer, these, they're differing views. There was a case brought by an elected judge in a state who said, under the First Amendment, I should be able to say whatever I want to say. If you elect me, Margaret Marshall, I promise I will never vote in favor of the death penalty. Or I promise if you vote, if you vote in favor of me, I will never uphold um, an abortion law. Now, the way states dealt with that was by codes of judicial conduct. And we said, if you're running for election as a judge, the, what the code said is, you can't say these kinds of things, you can't take money from those kinds of people. And the United States Supreme Court, in a decision that's now a decade old, essentially said the First Amendment says, Congress, now applicable to the state, shall make no law. And I think that had a more devastating consequence because now in state courts, and remember, 48 million cases. And if I were to say one thing this evening, you know, the United States has a great system of justice, but it can be in jeopardy. And I think that what is happening in state courts now with elected judges, with the Supreme Court decision opening or closing down judicial codes of conduct and now the infusion of money, I think really puts us in a very difficult position. Now, I, I have to just let me agree with that. I mean, absolutely. And, and you see, I, I dissented in that case in the Supreme Court. I have to be consistent. I have to take that point of view that, that the, the states do have the power to regulate what these judges will say when they're running for judicial election uh, through codes of conduct. But now, same problem. The problem is that then we have to make these distinctions. So I say, OK, that's what we're there for. It's a huge problem, just as campaign finance is a huge problem. And uh, I, I think we have to make those decisions. But there, there are two points of view. Another question. It's hard for us to see. Uh, yes, so, and if we could, if there's a hand over here. If we can get a microphone somehow ferried over there. Thank you. Um, I'm curious, and I'm trying to think about how to ask my question really, really clearly. Um, I'd love to get your perspective on the role of state law versus federal constitutional rights with respect to the individual rights of immigrants. I think it's all federal law. I mean, well, it depends on what you're saying. What, what, what depends on the rights and so forth. Look, the 14th Amendment says no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property. It doesn't say no citizen shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And the fact that it says person is important because that in various cases, in various uh, particular rights, it depends on the right, it depends on the circumstance, etc., has been said they protect people who are not citizens. And that means immigrants too. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't make any distinctions. You can make loads of distinctions. But uh, you see the nature of the problem. There are some protections. There are some protections because it says person. And it, I, my guess is that the state constitution just haven't had the cases. Well, the state, it'll be the state statutes. So, for example, states can decide to give immigrants, non-citizens, certain rights and not to others. And so we get lots of those kinds of cases. And, um, but but it's, a, it's an area that is heavily federally regulated, heavily federally yeah, regulated. Yeah. There's a immigration clause, a constitution, et cetera. Yeah. <laughs> okay, over, over here. Hi. First of all, <clears throat> thank you both for your tremendous service to our country. Um, we all have great lives because of what you do. Um, it wasn't that long ago, Justice Breyer, that Elliot would refer to you as the man who writes the Supreme Court's dissents, and things have changed. <laughs> so, yeah, I was, I was in the majority a lot this year. That's right. <laughs> which I prefer. <laughs> so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, what it's like being on each side and um, how uh, the 
the relationship between the justices is when... Oh, the, the relationship, first, the personal relationship is fine. I mean, we all know that we're not going to agree about everything. And I've, as I've said, and it's still true, I've never heard uh, a voice raised in anger in that conference room at somebody else. People don't insult each other. Uh, they don't tell mean, they don't say mean things. Even, I just haven't heard that. It's professional. You state your point of view. And uh, we're, re, you know, it's, it's, it's professional. It's collegial. Uh, we're not necessarily drinking buddies, but we might play bridge together. And we have our, and, and uh, uh, so we get on pretty well. And between a dissent and the majority, I'd rather be in the majority. Who said that? Between winning and losing, winning is better. All right, so, so, but, the, but uh, uh, the, the dissent performs an important function. And the first, and you'll never know, you will never see it. The first thing the dissent does is it improves the majority. No sometimes it switches the whole, occasionally it switches the whole court. But sometimes, more than sometimes, no one who writes a majority opinion or no person in this room, none of us, like to look like idiots. And, the, and the, if somebody in the dissent makes a good point there, you read that dissent and say, I'm going to change my opinion. And, and they do change. And you never see the best points the dissents make because they've been written out of the majority so that there's no need to make that dissenting point anymore. So I think it's a pretty good system. Now, what you're seeing, of course, are the failed dissents. You're seeing those that did not change people's minds enough. And still, they'll serve a purpose. You know, in a way, it's easier to write a dissent because you can say what you think and, you know, you say, fine, and nobody's going to say you. it doesn't make that much difference to the law. You hope it would, but nonetheless, etc. And maybe people will learn from it in the future. The issue will come back. It'll affect something else. And anyway, you've written it. Why not? Do it? But, but the, the, I exaggerate. But you see, it, it's a very helpful. I think it's a very, very helpful process of having those dissents, the concurrences, and, and having time, having time to, to think about uh, what you're going to say and, and revising it and, and revising it again and again and again. And that's true in, in, in every court. I mean, you, you, have a, you have seven. Nine is harder to work with than seven. Much harder. <laughs> Do you have anything to add? I was, I was going to say this, and I, you know, there, there's wonderful justice that takes place right across the United States, but I think one of the problems that goes back to elected judges with the constraints taken off, if Justice Blyer is on the Supreme Judicial Court of a, of a state and I run against him to defeat him, and say, not just to criticize the decision, but to say he's a skunk and a liar, and he's in the pay of big business or labor. Um, it makes relationships harder when you're on the court. And I am seeing, in cases right around this country, a fracturing of the collegiality of state supreme courts. It doesn't have to do with elected judges. We've had elected judges since the middle of the 19th century and they've worked well. But when you begin to change the rules, and there are more states, and watch them in your states, and watch them elsewhere, where there are fights very public between and among justices sitting on the court. Very painful, nasty, individual, horrible, non-collegial fights. And you just don't have that where you have a system like the United States Supreme Court or fortunately in Massachusetts or other states. So be careful. Be careful. And remember, it's in your hands. Not in the justices' hands. It's in your hands. And you have to say, no, we don't want that. Justice Breyer, let, let me ask one, one last, last question. I, I think I'm right in thinking that after another year, you will have served on the court for two decades, for 20 years. And I, I wonder, have your views about the court and its role changed in any significant ways over those 20 years? The first three or four or five, I mean, you're sitting there frightened to death in a sense. I mean, maybe you don't reveal it, but my goodness, I mean, there's nobody to correct you, and will I do this all right? And what Just, Chief Justice Rehnquist used to say is after five or six years, you stop wondering how did you ever get there, lightning did strike, and maybe you'll do all right, and who knows, and, and, and et cetera, and you're doing your best, period. And, and then you do. You try to do, you're, you're, David Souter said that. He said you're on duty all the time, and that's true, and that, that, that's, that's a, a problem. 
So over time, it is a different court. Justice White said that. He said with each new appointment, it is a, it is a different court. And, and it's different. It's different people. They bring different skills and different attitudes to the table. Uh, and uh, uh, I think uh, in some respects, it's, uh, we have more discussion of some things. In some respects, it's probably, the, I bet there are more 5-4 decisions now uh, uh, than there were. And uh, uh, over time, you get, you get to know the area uh, of the law. You get to formulate views. Uh, Sandra O'Connor used to say, you, your first uh, three, four, five, six years, you're, 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 it's like putting footprints in the sand, you see, in a particular area. Because you don't want to suddenly go in the opposite direction. You say, why not? Well, you know, there'd be no control if you're not consistent. I mean, you, you try to think out an area, and you try to then, then follow where you started. And, and you're learning, and you're developing, and, but, but you have sort of guidelines that, that you're, you're going to be not too different from the way you were at, uh, at the beginning. And uh, so it's, it's somewhat more, uh, probably more five fours now. Uh, people get on well. Uh, they're different personalities. Uh, but they're, they're, it's interesting. I mean, they're interesting people, and they're working hard, and they're trying to do their job, and I'm not going to go beyond that. <laughs> I will, though, go Bob, beyond that with one, in one respect. And you mentioned that there are more five to four decisions. You've written a lot about, about the danger of cynicism and the importance of uh, people accepting the court and its judgments. When there are so many five to four decisions, and now when so many times those five to four decisions happen to be five people who were Republicans and four who were Democrats. Not as it, often as you think. Not as often, you but on some... You the number of times you read in the New York Times or the Washington Post in an unusual grouping of five and four. <laughs> well, the unusual threatens to become the usual. I mean, this is, it's not always the same five and the same four. No, it's four. not, as we saw... But on some few, issues it is. is it? And, and, and the reason, you know, I'll, I'll give you the, I mean, my, my own view of that is, of course, it's not so surprising as you think, because uh, uh, people, for example, Justice Scalia and I often do not agree, all right? Why not? I don't think it's because he, he worked for Republican uh, administrations and I worked for a Democratic senator. I really don't think it's that. I think it's that, that, that he's, he takes an attitude towards law, which is law should be, at particularly the Supreme Court level, made up of rules that people can understand. And so try to get the clear rule. And he's uncomfortable when you can't come up with a clear rule. All right? A lot of what he writes is affected by that. And there is a point to what he says. I'm much more comfortable with a mess, in a sense. I think life is complicated, filled with differences. Don't go too far too fast. You'll find situations you never thought of. And be careful of saying something in black letter that's going to live for too long because there's too much that comes along by a surprise and hits you in the face. So it doesn't bother me so much not to have an absolutely clear rule. And I think you can teach by example. That's a common law method. And a lot of our differences will actually be about that, not all but a lot will. And if you get into an area like affirmative action, it's hardly surprising that once people start down a particular road and they think this is the right track, they continue down that road. And as far as acceptance is concerned, I, I said this the other day, but I'll repeat it. Say it, yes. it. It's the advice I got from my father. He gave me two pieces of advice. One was, stay on the payroll, which I've managed to do. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and the second, which I think is true, do your job. And if it's 5-4, it's 5-4. And I think ultimately people will, you hope, you have to hope, but ultimately those who know will go into it and they see that people are serious and trying to do their job, the court will earn respect for that even if it's 5-4. to four. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Two great justices. Zoe, hi. Look, I, I'm not going to jump down. <laughs>